From Harrenhal to Dragonfall, this is Maesterminds. Welcome back, folks, to Nerdist's House of the Dragon podcast. I'm Dan Casey, and once again, we're here to bring you the best Taros that Westeros has to offer with our weekly breakdown of House of the Dragon Season 2. Episode 4, titled The Red Dragon and the Gold, gave us both houses and dragons and fire and blood in equal measure. This is the halfway point in the season, and it gave us our clearest sign yet that war isn't just a bad dream, it really is upon us. And it also gave us one of our most shocking battles yet. We're going to dive deep into this episode in just a moment, but first, joining me as always on the Small Council is Nerdist staff writer, our resident lore master, and Damon Targaryen's dream journalist, Michael Walsh. That's a full-time job now. I have two full-time jobs. Yeah, he does not stop having uh, just nightmares galore on this show. But I'm curious, Mikey, with the amount that you have to think about this and all of the lore and Game of Thrones history, have you had any Westeros-related dreams or nightmares recently? Oh, every night since the Game of Thrones series finale, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, you know, some things will haunt us for a long time. Is, you, is your bed made of weirwood, perchance? That might have something to do with it. You know, when I bought it, they said, this is a bad idea, and I said, I don't think so. Look, you throw, past, you throw a posturepedic on that bad boy, you're good to go. All right, folks, we're going to break down this episode for you in just a moment. But first, as always, a spoiler warning. If you have not seen House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 4, this is your one and only warning. Book spoilers will be kept to a minimum, but specifically, if you haven't seen the episode yet and watched it, leave now before you hear something truly shocking. You all bore me. All right, let's get into it, shall we? Mikey, let's start with what were your overall impressions of this episode? How did it work for you? For those only listening, not watching, Eve Best <laughs> be a future Emmy nominee. Um, she best un- be. Oh, man, unbelievable performance. Talking top tier all time in the franchise. As for the episode itself, I really liked it the first time. I liked it even more the second time. Uh, There are a few changes in here that I think are more than defensible, but um, I don't, I didn't initially love, um, that's, I don't think that's a huge criticism. It's just, you know, we all have different reactions to things. Um, But the second time, maybe because I was expecting them and I was already used to them, uh, I had less of a problem with it. Uh, We'll get into what those changes were. Uh, But overall, this was a very faithful adaptation of the story. And I think what we see, especially at the end of this episode, is this franchise at its absolute best, delivering something that no other TV series can deliver. Um, The production, the direction, the acting, the spectacle, um, but spectacle with meaning, right? That was my big complaint last week. Um, This is, I, 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 this is kind of like, I, what else do you want from this show? Uh, And, the fact that this is the first real, real dragon fight, I, I don't think Daenerys and Jon fighting uh, a, a white dragon was quite the same, especially because we could not see it. Um, this, this was the big moment, the dance of the dragons, and it totally delivered, and I was really happy with it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is uh, Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, Westeros television at its best. I think that if you did not enjoy this episode, I agree with you. I feel like this is pretty representative of the ethos of the entire show because you had backroom wheeling and dealing. You had these interpersonal moments. You had these crises of conscience and you had fateful decisions which have gigantic ripple effects across not just the battlefield, but the realm at large. And I'm so thrilled with how they adapted the Battle of Rook's Rest specifically because it's a really cool moment to read about in the book. But seeing how they executed it, I thought it was really fascinating because we'll we'll talk about this in greater detail later on. But I think specifically the dragon riding, um, you know, it always kind of historically looked kind of goofy. I don't think the effects were quite there. But this episode for me really sealed the deal. I'm like, oh, wow, they they nailed this. The dragons look awesome. The way they play with verticality, the way they play with uh, POV shots, both you know, overhead, seeing the carnage of the battlefield, people looking up and seeing like these nightmarish creatures of of lore, like flying overhead. I thought they did really phenomenal work there and it elevated everything else, all the human drama that's unfolding in the background. So I thought this was a fantastic episode. I definitely think one of the high points of the series so far and something that, you know, Game of Thrones historically 
you know, th those seasons, they usually took their time to set the table. It took a couple episodes for things to get cooking. This season, you know, they came hot out the gate with uh, Blood and Cheese. And, you know, we had our opinions about Blood and Cheese. It wasn't our favorite adaptation. Uh, I think this was adaptation done uh, in a way that I really thrilled and delighted me. Because even though you know things are coming, like with Eve Best, for example, uh, and Rainus, I was still, like, on the edge of my seat when it's happening. Because... You know something's going to happen, but you're still waiting for that other shoe to drop. So I thought they really balanced that tension quite well. And we got some uh, phenomenal characterization, especially elsewhere in the realm, uh, especially in Harrenhal. Um, but before we go to Harrenhal, I'm curious, what, what worked best for you this episode? What worked, and not just Eve best? I, I mean, uh, Lord Darkling spitting at Sir Kristen Cole and calling him out and telling him his time will come uh, as I take my many notes during these episodes. All I wrote was MVP, MVP, oh, yeah. MVP. Um, that was such a I, badass shot, too, and it just, it happens so matter-of-factly, and then the camera just follows Sir Kristen Cole as he walks away, kind of just like, all right, well, I gave you an option, and everyone slowly starts bowing to him. I thought that was very well, well executed, pun intended. Uh, I also really liked uh, Jace speaking up on my behalf by calling out his mother's ridiculous plan <laughs> last week. Although those moments, you know, because they had Damon do it uh, with Rainey's earlier in the season, saying, like, if you had killed him at the Dragon Pit, you know, the, it's almost like the, the characters uh, are very aware of how silly some of these things are, which means the writers are, which is even more frustrating, because instead of having to address it later, don't do it in the first place. But I, I don't want to get too negative, because I, I was just happy to hear Jay say it. It for me, I, I it made me. I still I was still angry with the how episode three ended, but that made me feel better because it's like okay, I'm glad you're not just painting like there, that's the appropriate reaction that someone in his position or on the council should have to be like, you went where and did what for what purpose because, you know. She she has this grand secret, and that make and that honestly makes her sharing the Song of Ice and Fire with him later on even more impactful because he's like, I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. You won't let me do anything. You're making us look foolish in front of all of these like power hungry uh, bureaucrats who are like scrambling for power, trying to carve out their own little domain. So I I agree. I think that I like those little moments that really sort of may underscored everything that's happened so far, um, and even like other things as well where you had, uh, you know, when Damon's trying to raise a host, they specifically mention, oh, yeah, well, it's it's been a little difficult because of that um, nasty business with the uh, with the king's uh, son. So, you know, that that it's hurting your recruitment campaign a little bit. They really spun that around back on you. Um, but speaking of Damon, let us venture away from this introductory segment and go on to Heron Hall, because this episode, again, one, gives us even more of Damon's uh, just horrible REM cycle is just nightmare after nightmare. What did you think about uh, the first nightmare we see him have here where he's sort of uh, stalking Eamon only to see that it's him wearing an eye patch? Uh, as I mentioned last week, I love dream sequences like this. I think they are really insightful into the character, but they're also fun to debate. Um, and just like real dreams, the meanings can seem obvious and yet also elusive. I think the dream about... Um, Following Eamon through Harrenhal only for it to turn out to be himself was twofold. One, this is about who he fears. On one level, he fears himself because he knows how reckless he is. He knows that he is his own worst enemy a lot of the times. But on the other hand, he also fears his nephew because his nephew is essentially his one-eyed doppelganger. They are both fearsome. They are both fierce. They will both do whatever they need to win. They both are dragon riders who have very dangerous dragons. And I think in this episode, if you, if you didn't totally appreciate just how different dragons can be, uh, this really drove it home. They are both on arguably the two... I mean, Vagar is definitely the most dangerous dragon. Mm -hmm. um, Damon's on the second. And considering other things going on at Harren Hall, I think even without getting into any sort of spoilers, you can see you know, what's kind of developing here. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I especially loved what it then led to, which was even better than the dream itself. Yes. Uh, and I also, 
it, the thing that I just, my brain is just hardwired this way to look at wordplay, and I was like, oh yeah, of course, well, their names are anagrams, what do you expect? Of course they are these, like, mirror images of each other, they're the same bloodline, the same DNA swirling around inside there, and the same sort of frenetic, chaotic impulses, which we really saw this episode from Eamon specifically, and we'll get into that later on, but it's nice to see that, like, deep down, this is what Damon fears, is that, like, he's not just... Uh, making these reckless choices that endanger the realm, he is also going to have to face his darkest impulses in the form of someone else who's grown up perhaps idolizing him or at least seeing him for who he is and who he can be and just recognizing that capacity for violence and chaos in another person has to be a little chilling, especially when, you know, they're, they've both proven themselves to be pretty uh, pretty devious dogs uh, over the course of this season alone. So I'm very excited to see where it goes, uh, but more excited because I just love all of the the uh, hair and horror we've been getting. And this time we get yet another Rhaenyra nightmare. We get another Rhaenyra nightmare specifically about young Rhaenyra, played once again by Millie Alcock. Phenomenal job. Great to see her back. Always loved her performance. Uh, but Again, just a very witchy, creepy episode. Let's talk about that. what that leads to, sort of the, the nightmare in the throne room at King's Landing. What was your impression of that? What I can't get past is how they're not, in, in a good way, they're not specifically telling us what these dreams represent. And is it guilt? Is it self-doubt? Are these nightmares... Damon's subconscious playing out his real desires or is it playing out his greatest fears that he really is the monster that his family has always sort of believed him to be I don't think he knows and that's why I think in the dreams he's so terrified because he doesn't actually know how he feels there's just a lot of insecurity here and it's adding a lot of depth to a character that doesn't really do a lot of self-reflection we saw a very little bit of in Pentos but, you know, we usually just see Damon acting out or trying to get back in people's good graces without much in between. These dreams are kind of supplying that, but without, you know, making it clear what's going on because he doesn't know. So it really reflects the character yeah. well. It's, they're really well done. And the fact that he keeps seeing his young, his, the young version of his wife when she was his niece, which no matter how many times we talk about this stuff is always just so weird to be like, oh, yeah, he's seeing his niece, not his wife, who's the same person. He, she says to him in the dream, you created me, meaning you made me the heir to the Iron Throne. You put me on this path. You put us all on this path because you just couldn't be a good person. You know, it's, it's funny. If, if Damon had not been Damon, then he would have just been his brother's heir. People like Otto wouldn't have been worried about him being Magor the Cruel II. And then eventually Viserys would have had a son who would have replaced him and everything would be fine. We wouldn't have this war. So it, I think assuming that the castle itself or somebody in the castle is not making these dreams, these nightmares happen, if these are really just Damon's own mind, we are seeing him battling with a lifetime of mistakes, a lifetime of reckless behavior. And it's so good. It's really, it's really, really well written. Yeah, and it's nice to see that guilt play out because, you know, the way that Damon carries himself, he's someone who's very cocky, self-assured, abrasive. And you don't get the sense that he is a regretful person if he, you know, makes a, a mistake, like has the wrong son executed by assassins in King's Landing. He doesn't really apologize so much as he says, well... You know, it's, it could have been worse and then just moves about his day. But clearly he does carry this accumulation of deeds and actions with him. I mean, we see when he has that vision of his late wife, uh, Lena, when he sees a serving girl and he's just sort of racked by guilt there. You know, that was she she died during childbirth. It wasn't necessarily it, it wasn't his fault, but he clearly feels culpable in some way that maybe he couldn't do more, or couldn't save her because, you know, he's he's had his own 
trials and tribulations with succession, but they did seem like they were happy together, at least uh, outside of the realm of King's Landing and the realm of uh, Westeros. So it was definitely a bit shocking to see him him hallucinate her as well. And something else that I want to point out, which I saw, which I spotted via um, the amazing Joanna Robinson on Twitter, she pointed out, uh, you may know her as well from Talk to Thrones and also House of R over on The Ringer. She pointed out that the outfit that young Rhaenyra is wearing in this flashback is the same outfit that uh, Rhaenyra was wearing when Damon choked her previously during one of their encounters together. So clearly he feels guilty about that and it's playing writ large here. And also that dude just loves to chop off people's heads in that room. He did it to poor Vaymond uh, Valerian and now he did it here again to Dream Rhaenyra. So, you know, it definitely speaks to his character, someone who tries to uh, slice first and uh, and like figure things out later. Um, he- Maybe Vaymond shouldn't have been a, a traitorous liar. Well, who can say who shouldn't have done what, where, when, and why? But, uh, you know, that definitely uh, was a bit... uh, Rewatching that uh, episode, it was definitely shocking to see it because it's played for huge shock value because all of a sudden the top of his head is just gone. He let Um, him keep his tongue. He let him keep his tongue. That's true. You know, I guess we got to count our blessings while we have them. Um, But let's talk about, uh, you know, you sort of alluded to this. Maybe someone in the castle might be causing these nightmares or maybe just have more information about them. And that is uh, someone who I was thrilled and delighted to see, uh, especially because this time it just felt like a much better portrait of this character that I've been waiting for. And that is Alice Rivers. Gail Rankin as Alice Rivers. Phenomenal job this episode. Uh, So, Mikey, tell us about Alice, uh, your thoughts about about uh, Gail Rankin's portrayal and what 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 this scene what these scenes uh, said to you. This show does a really good job usually when it has a lot of freedom from fire and blood. It does a really good job, uh, despite my complaints about specific things. Overall, when it can fill in the gaps, it does a great job. Alice Rivers is this fascinating character in Fire and Blood, but we know almost nothing about her. She's so it, there's just these little pieces of her, and. The show could have leaned away from the the pieces of that puzzle. And instead, it's leaning into them. And I could not be happier with the portrayal of her because she's as strange and mysterious as she seems. And I said last week, you know, we were were joking that she sounded like she had uh, an American accent. Somebody said to us that was Scottish. I have a feeling they kind of knew that was coming because I went back and rewatched it and it did not seem to match up with her accent this episode but I said she was perfect casting and she is that scene with her and Damon which once again he has this dream where he's wandering through the castle and it ends with him standing in front of her and she is incredibly insightful she knows what's going on with him what's really bothering him that he's been that's been unspoken and there there are two ways to go with this right she's just smart She's smart enough to be a de facto maester at this massive castle. It's not out of the realm of possibility. She's just, you know, uh, has keen insight into people. She's paying attention. She, she even kind of gives him the information about how she knows this stuff, right? She provides the clues. But then there's the other side. I'm, I'm really an owl stuck in a human's body, right? And Damon calls her a witch. I'd like to think she's an owl witch. Uh... I'm totally up for anything here. Anything is possible with Alice Rivers. You know, in a world where we have wargs, where humans can Mm -hmm. go into the mind of an animal, why can't it work in the reverse? We know witches exist. We know magic exists, right? We saw how how powerful Melisandre was, right? She lived hundreds of years. But no matter what she turns out to be, if she's just a, a very wise, cunning, manipulative woman, or she is something much more magical... I absolutely lost my lore-loving mind when she got into the Curse of Harrenhal. I was yes. so excited. Uh, because there have been hints about why Harrenhal is cursed. Um, for those of you who don't know, I think we might have talked about it before, uh, Harren the Black was the last king of the Isles and the Rivers. If you ever notice, the Riverlands don't have... Um, it's not like the North or the West, right? It's, it's different because it wasn't its own kingdom when Aegon came. For, for centuries, the Iron Islands and Storm's End kept kind of trading off who controlled it. Harren the Black builds Harrenhal. It's meant to be impenetrable, the biggest castle ever. The day it's finished, Aegon kills Harren and his entire line wipes them out. 
And it always kind of seemed like maybe that was the curse. It's never been so explicitly said that, no, this is about the weirwood trees that he, he felt. And if you remember the children of the forest, the, the old gods, the, the first men, these are not just sacred trees. They are almost like living gods themselves. And as she says, there are spirits in these heart trees and you could still hear them whispering. I could not have been freaking out any more than I did. It was so good. And I hope that they keep expanding on this and exploring it and talking about what's really going on at Harrenhal. Yeah, uh, to me, I mean, Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon are at their best when they really toe that line of the occult. And because, look, we we have to accept this is a world full of fantastical things. There are dragons flying about. Why can't there be a uh, ma- a pseudo maester who uses black magic and witchcraft and potion making and alchemy to basically affect the same role? I, I do love the idea that she's actually three barn owls in a trench coat. Uh, but I also just loved her performance here. And I, I'm with you as well. You know, I think. I, I had zero question about her accent this time around. Uh, very, very much Scottish. Uh, it was just that that one line last time, probably from a distance, that just sounded caught me off guard. But this time, I'm like, who is this? Who is this witchy woman? What is she going to do? What is she giving Damon to drink? Is this because what is this like blood red substance? At first, when I was watching, I was like, what is she butchering? But when she mentions the uh, the weirwood trees, um, I, maybe it's like leaves from that or something, like some sort of weird, like psychoactive uh <laughs> she's making she's making homemade nyquil that has a very psychoactive <laughs> component because as soon as damon drinks it he just blacks back in at the uh at the table in the great hall at heron hall so to, to me it was just very fascinating to see what she represents because she represents chaos in a way that we haven't really seen so much on house of the dragon so far you know we got much more of that on game of thrones with characters like melisandre like you mentioned um but i'm just very excited to see what she means because she clearly not only has Damon's number, but Damon is fascinated by her. He tries to keep her at arm's length, but he's just like, how do you, how do you know? How do you know everything that's happening with me? How can you read my mind? Dan, this is the guy who was afraid of poison peas when he showed up at Harren Hall. Yes. And now he's just like, she's like, drink this. He's like, okay, great. Ooh, yeah. Thank what you. Is this, what is this? Borscht? I've had this for late night snack before. All right. Why not? Yeah, no, it was it was great to see that and great to get that additional context about not just the curse of Heron Hall, but the small detail that, hey, maybe the part of the reason you're having nightmares is because not only did the guy whose fam- whose family line was infamously ended after taking control of this castle by Aegon the Conqueror, uh, he cut down all those very holy trees. They used those same trees to make the bed that you now sleep in. So, uh, that was good so good luck. Oh. Good luck. You're sleeping on a Stephen King short story. Enjoy. And, and the thing, too, is that Harren Hall is right near the most sacred spot in Westeros. It's right near um, the the Isle of Gods, the, the where the, the green men are. And this is, you know, very, very important. Uh, the God's eye is right there. If you're going to cut down weirwood trees from anywhere in Westeros, don't cut them down here. Because, you know, weirwoods used to be everywhere. And this is why even the, the places that follow the seven, they tend to have at least one weirwood tree somewhere. Like all the rest are gone, but there's one. If you could go back, you know, go back a couple hundred years and tell Harren, like, Hey, Heron, of all the places not to cut down all the sacred trees, this is this is the most sacred spot. Don't do it here. There's there's got to be another viable source of lumber like 20 leagues over that way. Just have your guys march a little bit further. You'll thank us later. This castle won't be cursed for all time. Always. It's yeah, I I agree. I definitely uh, I, I love that. I love the. See, seeing how these religious uh, factions within Westeros play out, that sort of push and pull between the old gods and the new, and just how dominant the Seven have become. But even so, there's still that level of what they might view as superstition, but as many of as we've seen with many occasions, like there's more to that superstition than meets the eye. Um, and I'm you know, glad you mentioned the God's Eye. That is a location to potentially pay attention to for future seasons, most likely, of this show. Um, but I'm definitely curious to see what it looks like when they when they finally visit it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see more at Heron Hall play out and we get a bit more happening there later on. But first, I want to take a detour. We're so close to King's Landing. Why not venture over to King's Landing and talk about all the 
infighting happening there. Egon, just a, a furious, uh, just sauced boy, uh, schemers taking the reins, and his brother Aemond playing his hand in a major way, especially in that small council scene. So let's start there. What were your impressions of what we see unfolding in King's Landing this episode, Mikey? Uh, I love the way they used High Valerian to do a couple things. It showed the uh -huh. difference between Aemon and Aegon. You know, Aemon is fluent. Aegon is like, you know, his second year of Spanish speaking. Yeah. Um, but it also did this thing that I think is really important. And it's so easy to forget if you really only know the story from Game of Thrones. The Targaryens are outsiders. The other families have been around for thousands of years. The history of Westeros is so much older, and the, the Targaryens have really only been here for a blink of an eye. And at this point in the story, they've only really been around for 100 years. They were near Dragonstone, but they, they were on Dragonstone, but they weren't involved with what's going on. So these are still, in many ways, like it, invaders from another land, and there's always this push it and pull with how accepted they really are. So I really like that that going on. I also like that it wasn't clear how many other members of the small council could speak High Valerian uh, it, versus how just uncomfortable they were in the entire situation. I really like that, trying to figure out who knows what's what. Like, does Tyler Lannister seems pretty smart. Does he know what's going on? I... To me, I didn't think that Tylen knew. I thought he was just uncomfortable because he knew they were clearly arguing. I, I think if anyone in there would know, it would have been um, the Grand Maester because it's just someone who probably would have perhaps studied that at some point. I think everyone else was just clearly seeing this power play take place. You could just watch Aegon's face during this scene as in just his like pitiful answer where, yeah, it's just like he was studying High Valyrian on Duolingo while his brother's like... Do you have a better idea? Please avail us of your ma of your like incredible strategic mind. Uh, and it, but it was also just kind of crazy to me that Eamon so flatly said, "Oh yeah, um, well here's what's happening. Sir Kristen Cole is going to Rook's Rest to try and take it over because uh, it's going to drive a wedge in the Black Council and like do damage to Rhaenyra and her team. And I know this because he's been messaging me privately. He's been sending me strategic ravens and not the king." The, that he's laying it all out there so clearly, I think, also tees up his actions later in the episode very nicely as well. So what were your thoughts on uh, Eamon sort of uh, really kind of coming out as not a supervillain, but someone who is determined to get on the throne this episode? That scene in the moment makes it look like Eamon's really competent and Aegon's totally incompetent. But by the end of the episode, I think not that it, Aegon it suddenly looks wise, but you see how short-sighted Eamon and Cole are being. You know, Otto and Allison kind of understood. We need to kind of massage Aegon until he loses interest and then we can do it, right? Those two don't have the wisdom of Otto and Allison, so they're just off scheming by themselves. If you remember, Otto discovered them scheming and like lost his mind, rightfully, and we're seeing why here. If they had made Aegon feel a part of it, or even better, made mm -hmm. it feel like it was his idea, then a, the big disaster at the end can be averted. And this is the problem when you have people who are, are just looking for the, the glory of war instead of being thinking rational people. And you really feel Otto's absence in this moment. And it definitely feels at the end. I was going to say, not just Otto's absence, but Allison's absence, too. I mean, you know, even her, like, proverbial come-to-Jesus talk with her son was more just, like, dragging him over the emotional coals that wasn't really, sh like, didn't really give him context for why they're doing what they're doing, just kind of made him feel even worse, and he's already in his cups. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but... You know, he is just left to this room full of what he perceives as boring vipers who are just like trying to carve out their own domain. Um, you know, we've got Laris, who is just sort of being like the patient sniper waiting for his time to swoop in and strike. We have uh, Tylen, who is, you know, trying to assert some control. And he does have probably, I would say, arguably some of the most control in that room, given that he controls the treasury and not just for the finances of the crown, but also he has all of Rhaenyra's finances locked up. But on the other hand, they sort of talk about this later on, they're also having their own economic crisis because of the blockade, which we don't really hear much about until now. And I think that also sort of speaks to why we constantly see 
Corliss Valerian um, at the at the shipyard on Driftmark. It's because, it, and I might be mistaken here, but my my interp- my interpretation was based on the book that House Valerian has King's Landing blockaded, so they can't get supplies in or out. Right? Yeah, they control the they control the gullet, and I, it, the this episode mentions the the few things that Rhaenyra does have to her advantage, and it makes it sound like it's not that impressive, but it really is. They're, they're, each side has their strengths, and controlling, controlling commerce into King's Landing is a big deal, especially because it's, it's hard sometimes to understand how big King's Landing is. There are as many people in King's Landing as there are in the North. At least there are by the time by the time of Game of Thrones, but even now it's it's a gigantic city with so many people, and those people need to be fed. Those people need jobs because if you don't feed people and you don't give them work or you know even entertainment, right? Bad things happen. So being able to to constrict King's Landing is a big advantage, and having Corlys Valerian and his fleet is a big advantage for Rhaenyra. And I think the Greens are almost underestimating that, even as they kind of recognize the problems it's causing. Anyone who has played the Game of Thrones board game from Fantasy Flight Games knows how important it is to assert naval control, because otherwise you are stuck in your port, you can't muster troops, and you can't transport people effectively. So uh, thanks to years of playing that, incredibly stressful uh, overly detailed risk on steroids board game I definitely that was instantly I was like oh yeah of course you, you control the seas you're good they're, they they have no way out of here what are they going to just keep mustering ships and trying to break through it's not going to happen not going to happen they need dragons to break through that at bare minimum but even then very dangerous as we've seen this episode not always a guarantee of success especially when the other side has dragons too but something I want to talk about here uh, I mentioned it briefly is Alicent we spend a good deal of time with Queen, uh, the Queen Dowager Alicent this episode, and we see her in a variety of different ways. We first see her, she is in crisis. She is holding on to Viserys, um, one of the figures from his uh, painstakingly crafted model of uh, Old Valyria. And he has a dragon. It already looks like the dragon's been damaged and put back together. But then she's startled by a knock at the door, and she drops it again, fracturing it even further, which is a nice, a nice bit of, you know, on-the-nose symbolism for what we're seeing happen here. But I still appreciated it because I just enjoy any time we get to see more aspects of that tiny little model. Uh, but we also saw her get a very special visitor, and that was the Grand Maester. And he brewed her some moon tea, which is basically plan B for Westeros, um, because plan A of having Sir Kristen Cole's baby is clearly not an option. Um, so what was what was your takeaway from uh, it, not just this scene, but where we see Alice in this episode, Mikey? I think this is a tough episode for her if you're a fan of hers, um, not because she got pregnant with Cole's baby or whatever. I don't you know uh, how she's going to have Cole's baby. It's talk about like. Just putting everybody in danger. Um, I really like the scene with the Grand Maester because she is clearly desperately hoping that she wasn't wrong about her husband's deathbed fake change of mind. You know, she's going through the histories, which Laris comments on. She asked the Grand Maester, did he ever mention it to you? And the Grand Maester basically says in the most polite, tactful way, no, he didn't. Like, he clearly didn't change his mind. He never mentioned it to me. What I think was tough for her was not getting rid of the evidence of the moon tea and then letting Lara Strong, who knows everything about everything, come in and realize what's going on, is, uh, although he probably already did. And she then follows this up with the scene with, with Aegon, which is my, my, note, my note was oof, oof. <laughs> like, this, this is his mom. You know, this is his mom. And she talks about, oh, you don't know the sacrifices that were made to put you on. He didn't want the throne. He didn't want this. He was not raised for this. He does not have the constitution for this. He is a craven. He should never have been given this responsibility. And now she's acting like like he fought for this or wanted it. How about a little love? And, and she, I think, more than anybody is responsible, more than the 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 Green Council, she's responsible for what he does here at the end, flying off to Rook's Rest, because she tells him, you know, do nothing. Do Mm -hmm. nothing. Just sit here. What thoughts would you have? Yeah, what thoughts would you have? Idiot, you stupid moron. 
I regret having you. Uh, she, she is the one who, who drives him to do this. And you compare this with the scene with Rhaenyra and Jace, right? Mm-hmm. Jace, Jace comes at his mom in this episode, rightfully. We've already talked about it. You know, but he, he sees, like, you're, you're, your council is falling apart without you. We don't even know what you are. We don't even know what you're doing. You refuse to act. And instead of, like, getting mad at him and calling him out, she pulls him in and explains, and she's loving. And we see this bond between the two of them that simply does not exist between Allison and her son. And it makes you wonder, what was Allison doing all of these years? You know, it, I'm not going to say she's wholly responsible for for Aegon. He had a dad too, right? They had family, but she put him in this spot that he was not prepared for, that he should not have, and now she's holding it against him that he can't live up to it. Sorry, she's she not can- half the man you wanted. She kind of alludes to what she was doing, though, where she's like, I was ruling when your father was sick. Like, yeah, she was basically steering the ship when Viserys was uh, just falling apart uh, bit by bit. So I may, maybe that's maybe that's her reasoning there. Um, you know, maybe she just never expected. But also maybe she just that's the other thing. She just never expected that Viserys uh, and her would have a son on the throne when it was so clearly stated that Rey Nero is going to be the one to succeed Viserys. So that may, maybe that's a reason, but I, I, it's not it's not a good reason by any stretch of the imagination. But it is a nice parallel there, especially when you see both kids are very impetuous, don't understand what their parents are doing, like really rankling under uh, the stress of having to deal with these like idiots on their council and even the wise people on their council but the way they go about it i think is just drastically different and i agree she is ultimately the one i think who sort of it's that last push he needed he was already kind of feeling underappreciated like people are going to celebrate sure Kristen cole and his brother more than him and like he's just being told to do nothing and he just can't take it anymore he's just like at a breaking point we've already seen him at his breaking point when he just broke down crying in his chambers and and his mom did nothing and i get it they've all been through tragedy they've all been through so much uh but this should be a time for them to come together and strengthen each other but instead they're just putting up walls and driving each other away and you know fighting for power and that's going to i think create these cracks in their armor that we see play out over the rest of this episode which definitely uh i gotta say one thing i gotta say one thing please i could almost defend her if Aegon had burned his father's books but he did not he simply moved them he's not a complete monster so no defense of allison here if Aegon had burned the books though (laughs) i'd be on board i'd be on board it was i mean it was really funny where he's just he's just indignant he's like what? I have moved them. It's my room. It's like, yeah. look, I, I would move my dad's old stuff out of my room if I was taking over his bedroom or something, but I get it. It's uh, it's her right of her to guess that he might have burned them because he clearly does not seem to care for that which came before him or family tradition as evidenced by his lacking mastery of High Valyrian. Um, I'm just going to say, though, Tom Glenn Carney, just phenomenal job this episode, like across the board. He just plays this character so well. You see this sort of like, not an imbecile. He's just like this, he's guileless and like just rudderless. He needs direction and the people steering him are just giving him bad direction. And so he's just, he can't get out of his own way. Like it may be if his, maybe if Sir Otto Hightower was still here, he might be in better hands, but you know, he, he slapped that hand away and uh, now he's left Sir Kristen Cole, who's nowhere to be seen because he's off creating a secret ploy to kill dragons with your brother. So I understand why he would probably be a little bit upset, a little bit impetuous. And you know, who among us hasn't wanted to climb on a giant lizard after knocking back a couple gallons of wine in the middle of the day at our parents' house. <laughs> What's the point of having the giant flying lizard if you're exactly. not going to ride him? Yeah, but uh, it turns out that uh, driving under the influence is a bad idea, no matter what the vehicle, and doubly so if you're on a dragon. But before we get into that moment, let's talk about Dragon Stone, because we talked about the Green Council, we alluded to Black Council, but what were your impressions of where we find Rhaenyra and the Council on Dragonstone this episode? We see that you need strong leadership because... Otherwise, everybody will just kind of try to fill that void. 
you know, if there is a, a power void, people will try to fill it. And there's, they mentioned, you know, she didn't name you, you hand. This is another sign that she's not very good at this job. How does she not name a hand? She needs somebody who can speak with authority. This is why kings, going back to Aegon, have had hands of the kings. She needs a hand of the queen. And the fact that she hasn't named one, even though she has a couple of very good candidates, you know, she had Rhaenys, and there's Corlys, who shows up and does kind of restore order. He's just yeah. so, you know, he just has that kind of power. This is He's I, got I aura, like, for sure. Yeah, and the show maybe hasn't quite hammer this the, the way it should have he is a legendary figure while he is alive <laughs> he is the greatest sailor in Westeros's history he's an incredible person everybody respects him he speaks with authority it's really absurd he's not already the hand of the queen um, or his wife or somebody or her son it, we just see her continue to struggle with the actual job of being the queen uh, she's been so focused we talked about being a good person it, it can you be a good person and a good ruler? This is the very heart of A Song of Ice and Fire. What does it actually mean to be a good ruler? This is something Jon Snow struggled with, right? Jon Snow had to kill the boy, as Maester Aemon told him. I love that the Black Council is sort of in disarray because it reflects her mistakes. I love that her son is also completely over her crap. And, you know, he... He is supposed to be the heir to the Iron Throne. It's good for them to see, like, hey, we're yeah. backing a family that that has a strong leader in 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 line. And I, I really liked all of that. I loved the venom that Jace put into his uh, sort of dressing down of his mother's. And where were you? Like, you didn't think to uh, let anybody know about this? Uh, and I also loved the little detail of Masaria watching from the shadows, like uh, Statler and Waldorf of Spycraft. Um, and just up in the balcony there. It's like, just give her a seat at the damn table already. Um, but my my takeaway was, yes, I, I loved seeing Corliss Valerian be like, you know what? I am spending too much time at the shipyard. I should go check on what my uh, liege lord and my, my queen are doing. I should maybe just see how things are going over here. But the line that stood out for me was Rhaenyra when she said, There are those who have mistaken my caution for weakness. Let that be their undoing. And my question to you, Mikey, is do you believe her when she says this? To me, it feels like it feels like I half believe it. I believe that she wants to do something, but it does feel like bluster a little bit. The, the whole idea is that when her son uh, Luke is killed, that's when the war really begins. Except that didn't happen here, right? That didn't happen. She's done everything she can to not fight the war. And she has watched as the, the Greens have besmirched her right they blamed her for this child's murder and they've uh, taken some of her uh, allies who quickly fell I, I don't know what has she done here she hasn't done anything so i don't really know if i can believe that i need to see it more in action and the fact that the one time she does do this she falls for what seems in her gut she knows is a trap right she's like why is he going to rook's rest that doesn't really make sense and she still does it anyway. To me, it feels like her hand is being forced. She has been backed into a corner. Everyone on her council is mad at her. Like She is at risk of losing the tenuous grasp on power that she has. And if she can't tighten that grasp by doing something, then she is going to lose control. So she knows that even if this is a trap, she has to send a dragon. But the thing that sort of confused me is like, don't offer to send yourself like, I understand you want to keep people out of harm's way, but, like, that everyone's mad at you for just riding off into danger without a thought to your well-being. This is the epitome of that. And I understand why she wouldn't want to send Jace, but it, I think it sort of paves the way for Rhaenys and her dragon Maelys being the only viable candidates for this. It doesn't feel like it's a suicide mission. It just feels like it's a an extremely high-risk mission because... You know, even though Sir Kristen Cole doesn't have dragons, they, everyone can tell that something's up with this. But I think that Rainus also knows that she has to do something here because something must be done or else their cause is forfeit. Well, there's a couple things here. Send all three. All three of you go. There's strength in numbers. You know, just just go all three of you. I understand maybe you don't want to leave Dragonstone un, uh, unprotected, but, you know, you still got Baylor around. It, 
just go. I did like that she said, I'll go. You know, she's taking responsibility. She's not trying to hide from the fight. And there's, I think what's really good about this is that it's her son who's like, Mom, people have bent the knee to you. They've sworn to, to you. And the subtext there is, if something happens to you, it's pretty obvious I'm a bastard. And they probably aren't going to support me in quite the same way. If you die, all is lost. Mm-hmm. And he's right. And this is the great thing about this story. And the show has gotten this mostly right. Every decision has consequences that you can never predict down the line. And here we see, right? Rhaenyra, she she has these children out of wedlock. So obviously out of wedlock. And you know, with a certain person, there's no doubt really in anybody's mind that now we see she can't even fight with her dragon. Her One of their biggest advantages going into this war is that the, the blacks have more dragons. She is essentially taking herself off the board because if something happens to her, she's basically dooming her son that people won't follow. So that was really good, and I really enjoyed the subtext of that scene there. Well, speaking of uh, actions that have consequences, let's talk about the Battle of Rook's Rest, the big centerpiece of this episode, the big dragon battle. I'm curious, what what were your thoughts on how they adapted this? We sort of touched on this a bit at the very beginning of this episode, but, you know, I'm curious, what were your thoughts on how this played out, a seemingly innocuous attack on a sort of nothing burger of a castle that happens to be owned by one of the members of Rainier's small council. What were your thoughts about how this played out? Overall, I really loved it. Uh, There are a couple changes that I'm back and forth on a little bit for one. Uh, And again, this is, these are not the type of changes that I'm really upset about. These are totally defensible. It's just more of a preference. Uh, The first one is that the, the plan always seemed as though both Aegon and Aemon were there, right? And mm-hmm. this is send two dragons instead of one, because if yeah. you're trying to if you're trying to draw one dragon out, you know. But the thing is, Cole's plan he has no idea how many dragons are coming, and I don't care how big Vagar is. If it's a two on one fight, Vagar is going to be in trouble. So you have two of them there. The fact that they they made this change, which is totally believable, just makes Cole's plan a little less impressive, which is fine. I don't mind if Kristen Cole looks less impressive, obviously. I hate him. Uh, but that part, I'm, I'm back and forth on a little bit. The other big change here is to Aemon. One of the things I've always found most fascinating about Aemon Targaryen is that he's clearly ambitious. He clearly wants to rule but he's fiercely loyal to his family. It's like his defining trait. He is like the Greens' greatest warrior because he is all about the Greens. And they've made a major change to him, which is he just straight up tries to murder his brother here. The, the, a couple like the first, times. Yeah, yeah. So the first time is Cole calls him, let's go. And he's about to get up on Vagar and fly, and he sees his brother, and he's like, yeah, go off by yourself. Maybe something bad will happen to you. It's only when Cole is like, call him again that he shows up. And when he does, his brother's all happy and instead he, he tries to bathe them in, in dragon flame. The, in Fire and Blood, the fight is described as the two of them kind of teaming up on mm-hmm. Ailey's and they both they all kind of fight and two of the, tra- the dragons crash with their riders and only aim in with Vagar. This is very different. And you might love it. And on my second viewing, I liked it a little bit more. I just... My personal preference is, I think it's more interesting if you have all of the ambition of Aemon, but you are also driven by fierce loyalty and it pulls you apart versus, as you said, he's almost a supervillain here. He tries to murder his own brother. He tries to murder his own king. And uh, as we all know, the, there's, the gods look down on kinslayers worst of all. You know? and, and then at the end, he, he goes to end his brother for a third time uh, before Cole stops him. So... Uh, he, I'm not criticizing this. I'm just explaining why I am not sure how I feel about this. Yeah, it, it, I will say it, it did add an interesting dimension to Eamon's character because sort of accidentally killing Luke. I thought that was interesting because he definitely wanted to scare his nephew. He definitely wanted to do some damage to his nephew. He definitely wanted to like put the fear of God into him and he pushed things too far because he was impetuous and that wound up getting not only his nephew, but their dragon killed and sort of putting them on this inescapable road towards war. 
Now he seems to be much more strategic and much more deliberate in what he's doing. Here, he is not, he's not being impetuous. He's annoyed that his brother shows up, but he's just like, all right, fine. He wants to show up. I'm not going to let this interrupt my plan. I'm going to wait. I'm going to lie low and I'm going to wait. Let him have his moment and then I will swoop in. And then they illustrated something that I think they do a great job of communicating in the book, but we haven't really seen as much in the show yet. And that is not just the scale of these dragons. You know, Vagar, the biggest dragon in the world. You've seen that vagar has been through the ringer, all of those, like, holes in his gigantic leathery wings from battles past. Um, you also see just how much, as dragons get older, their fire becomes hotter and deadlier. And that's why, you know, a dragon like Vagar can do so much damage to a younger dragon like Sunfire that on which Egon rides. Now, Sunfire had already been pretty brutalized by that point. You see, uh, my other favorite detail from this was uh, after Melee scratches Sunfire, like claws its torso, he flies low and his hot blood steaming because it's so dragon blood is so hot. It starts burning the soldiers upon which it lands. And I was like, this is such a sick detail they included here. And I'm so happy they did that. Yes, because to me, it was like, okay, this is like one of those untold horrors that you would never even think to expect. But I'm so glad they included it because they alluded to that a couple times in the books. And it was just very awesome to see here. I also just loved seeing the various stages of, of this battle progress. You saw at first, it's just kind of like a, a military siege, like trying to lay siege to a castle. And that's horrifying in its own way, as you see just all these scores of arrows raining down on the troops. Then you get Melis, who's just raining down dragon fire. Then you get Sunfire, who comes in and the dragons are doing battle. And then finally, all hell breaks loose when Vagar finally arrives. And I just thought the sort of narrative build and the choreography of this episode and the dragon fight in particular were so well done. So, you know, really hats off to uh, director Alan Taylor, uh, writer Ryan Condal and the whole team, especially the VFX team, because they animated their asses off this episode. They made it look real. They made it they like those dragons felt like they had weight. Seeing them fly through the air, seeing the different ways they fly, the different way that Vagar flies compared to Sunfire, compared to, compared to Melis, and even seeing my my other favorite, the impact that Melis makes after it falls from the sky, and that overhead shot of its smoldering corpse has just crushed like half of the castle, and then as Kristen Cole sort of regains consciousness, you hear Gwen Hightower in the background being like. All right, once more into the breach, lads. Let's get them. And it's it's just so well done because they do the chaos of battle so well. But here you have that added element of, you know, the fantastical with these dragons in there. So I, I definitely I definitely enjoyed that. Um, and I also I also I have to say I enjoyed some some things from Kristen Cole that he did in this battle. I you know I agree with you. His plan may have been a little suspect um, if it was not always the plan to have two dragons with one waiting in surprise because that's how it's played off in the book. And I know that's maybe like oh this is the official history. King Aegon was definitely supposed to be there. It wasn't a huge mistake that we're trying to cover up. Yeah. But it just it seems more tactically sound uh, in that capacity. And but who knows there's maybe. A- there's going to say there's Go a ahead. small change. There's a small change here, and it was a good one, uh, just in terms of you, we're making a TV show. We want the action to keep going. Uh, in the, in Fire and Blood, it's originally a siege, and Lord Staunton calls for help to Dragonstone, and I think it's nine days or twelve days before, you know, uh, Rainy shows up. So there's time, and you know, in in that version of the plan, Cole might have a chance to have you know. Uh, spotters sending ravens and saying, "Oh, they finally sent one. This is why we need two, Or you know, maybe. But it, this change was good, and it, the the change also forced Rhaenyra to kind of recognize something strange here, because in the books, she doesn't have to doubt why she needs to send help or why he's attacking Rook's Rest. He's doing it. It's been going on. Um, as for Cole, I know what you're going to say. You liked how when Aegon shows up, he adapts and he pretends like this has been the plan all along. Oh my goodness, your own king is here. We've been we've been blessed with by the Seven with divine purpose. Great, you're right. Good job by Cole. I can't Such believe- a smart pivot. Such a smart pivot. Oh, oh. oh sorry. Oh, I can't believe I said good job by Cole. But, <laughs> but, 
But if you think I can't turn this around on Kristen Cole, you haven't been paying attention. If Kristen Cole had included his king in the first place, his king would not be a maimed mess on the ground. This all goes back to Kristen Cole. Aegon is half dead because of him, the one who named him. The one who named him Hand of the King, and he is more responsible than anybody. Even Aemon. Yeah, he's even more responsible than Aemon. I'm putting on Cole. They should, uh, oh, they should probably point. nickname him the uh, King Melter instead, because uh, that's two under his watch that have slowly melted away to nothing. Uh, one bit by bit and one all in one chunk here. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely one of the most shocking parts of the episode is seeing Aegon crash out, seeing him crash to the ground in this heap of gore and fire and dragon bits. And we're left sort of on a cliffhanger of like, what happened here? Is he OK? Is he going to survive? And it it doesn't look good. No matter what happens, it doesn't look good. If he survives this, he's going to have a long and arduous recovery. And it also made that moment with Aemon so sinister. Because he's walking up with a Valyrian steel blade to presumably do a coup de grace on his brother and claim the throne for himself, question mark? The fact that Kristen Cole arrived just then. It was also nice to see that clear division in how they felt. Like Sir Kristen Cole, for all of his bluster, he is clearly horrified to see this happen. And he is so panicked when he arrives at... Aemond uh, standing over Aegon that I, you, I believe him. I believe that he was not anticipating any of this. He thought everything was going according to plan. And I don't think that, you know, for all of his uh, betrayals and his willingness to commit murder and disrespect uh, the White Cloak and disregard his vows, I don't think he was uh, ready to slay the king uh, to put Aemon on the throne. I think they thought they were like strategists in cahoots, and Aemon maybe was like, oh, what if I take this a step further? Is that a bad thing? What if I push this too far like I always do? Is that a bad thing? So I was definitely, that was a good sort of dynamic there, and I'm curious how that's going to play out in next week's episode. You know, and we see Cole has to accept and face the truth of what he's helped create. It's one thing to talk about going to war, and it's a one thing t- for, for people, soldiers, to fight each other. Now he has seen what fire and blood really means. And you talked about this. This episode, I think probably better than anything I've ever seen, really gets the scope, the epic scope of these dragons and how destructive they are, how big they are. You know, we see them in the sky, and they do a great job giving us uh, perspective on just how big they are. Vagar, Vagar coming over those trees is a beast i mean it's oh. it's like we're watching it we know we know he's not a real creature and i'm like oh of my course God. I, I, uh, I was watching and i'm still like oh he's yeah. huge and and we also see when he walks on the ground he's basically creating earthquakes and he's just stepping on soldiers willy-nilly and that's what actually knocks cole off it's just vagar walking i think that final shot is so effective because we don't see how bad Aegon is we yes. experience it through Cole's reaction. Uh, I, I don't think we're really giving anything away considering the episode ends with a peek at the next week's and they, they already let us know Aegon's alive. Uh, I also don't think Eamon would have been taking out his sword for a quote-unquote mercy killing if he were <laughs> just, just poking dead. him? Yeah. You dead? Yeah. You dead? I'm not quite dead. Yeah, he, uh, got, he got better. He got better. Uh, so so that, that was very effective and uh, that's that's a kind of a classic storytelling technique, right? Let us experience the horror through somebody else's reaction versus seeing it ourselves. And I thought that was more effective than just showing yeah. how, how we can only imagine how bad Aegon looks. Well, especially because Aegon's body is motionless, but you can see that Sunfire, while like brutalized and in, in extreme pain, is still alive. You hear labored breathing, groaning, growling. So... I'm curious what we're going to see from Sunfire and Aegon in in the next episode. You know, I, I, it's definitely not going to be a pleasant time at King's Landing. That's for certain. Not that we've had many pleasant times there this season so far. But I want to uh, sort of wrap things up now uh, as we head into the finale of the episode, the second half of the season, um, the back half of the season. We're at the halfway point. Who was your MVP this episode? I believe you alluded to it already, but who is your MVP, Mikey? 
Uh, I've got two. I was usual. I don't know, really know what this means. Uh, Lord Darkling did what I would like to do, spit at Sir Kristen Cole. But um, <laughs> if we're just talking when, when we remember this episode, this is going to be the Eve Best episode. Which 100%. She, what she does without speaking during the, the Battle of Rook's Rest is, is as good as it's ever been in this franchise. Like, I've been working on this list of the best acted scenes in both Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. This is going on. Uh, the the determination, the acceptance, the fear, the 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 willingness, it's incredible. And the more you watch the scene, the more you'll pick up on her and just how much she's doing. And then you remember she's not really on a dragon. She's doing this atop a giant piece of foam against a green wall. <laughs> like this is this is not like the most natural environment for a performer and it feels so real and it's so heartbreaking and it actually really Knowing, I, I knew what was going to happen to her, right? But now that everybody does, it really makes me even hate the scene with her and Alan of Hull earlier more because I just wish she could have died kind of ignorant of... I don't think we're spoiling anything. If you don't, if you haven't picked up on this by now after this scene, Alan of Hull is pretty clearly the bastard son of, of Corliss, right? Like, if yeah, you didn't I mean, get that... They, yeah. They all, but, they all but say it out loud. It's, yes. it's so, not even subtext. Enough. It is text at this point yeah. it's italicized text but it is if, text if we just spoil that for you I, I, that's on you not on us um i kind of wish that she could have just been ignorant of that um although it does add a little extra layer to his story going forward that he yeah has to kind of live with that to me to me it actually added to sort of the rich tapestry of her because she is not she's a sharp cookie she's not ignorant she knows like Oh, my husband is the most legendary sailor and swashbuckler in all of Westerosi history who's been all around the world. You mean that he's I, of course she knows that he's had a dalliance or 100, but, you know, he's always done a pretty good job, it seems, of sep of keeping that away from their home life. And so to have it sort of not rubbed in her face, but omitted. I think that's the thing. He did he didn't feel it was relevant to mention that oh yeah the the sailor who saved my life is um my secret bastard son who I've kind of been you know keeping close by even though you don't really want him around and she's like yeah well guess what he saved your life so he should probably be elevated and rewarded why are you having him still hoist the mainsails and polish the anchors or other seafaring activities that I definitely know what they are. Um, battening mopping, down the hatches. The yeah. Mop, yeah the, poo the, yes. The, pooping mopping. on the deck. Um, mopping, so mopping. It, it's to me, it added to that and also just made it made her more badass because she's just like, yeah, I know this. Now you got to do the right thing because you're just going to make us look bad. And I think that also is what helps get under his skin to make Corliss come back to the small council table at the Black Council because she's like, OK, yeah, my my wife is right. She she kind of read me uh, not the riot act, but took me to task on this. And I do need to kind of step up. I can't just ignore everything in front of my eyes uh, and just hide away at the docks. I need to step up and uh, be a landlubber for a little while as well. So, yeah, I agree. Eve Best, uh, Rainis, uh, you know, the flight of the dragon rider. She was the far and away MVP this episode. Uh, we touched a bit on um, Alan and uh, that sort of Easter egg, I guess. It's more of a dragon seed, if you ask me, uh, depending on like how the how, how all of these things shake out. He's got he's got the bloodline through uh, Corliss. But were there any other Easter eggs or moments that fans might have missed this episode that you think that we should mention here? Yeah, Willem Blackwood, who came to Harrod Hall, uh, that's the person Damon was speaking to when he came out of his stupor. The guy we who looked him. like brave, brave Sir Robin from Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we met him in season one at Storm's End when he uh, tried to pitch himself to young... He mentions this. He tried to pitch himself to young Rhaenyra. And then he got into a battle with a Bracken and he killed him. Uh, it does not... It looks very different than he did as a kid. Um, yes. Just as exciting was he mentioned that he is basically uh, the regent for his nephew, Benjicott Blackwood, which is very exciting for book readers. On the opposite side of that is there are seem to have been some changes with characters at River Run. Specifically, we met Oscar Tully, whose uh, grandsire is basically 
unable to rule, which is why they can't call their bannermen to fight for Damon. It seems as though they have combined um, Oscar Tully with a couple of other characters, and if that's true, it means we're not going to meet uh, one of my favorites later on. Uh, it's possible he'll still come back. Which, uh, which character? Well, they, they seem to have combined Oscar into th- three characters, and I kind of get it when you hear their names. It seems uh-huh. as though they have combined Oscar on its own fine, and Elmo, and uh, <laughs> Grover. <laughs> so, oh, uh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So if they... Uh, if, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said Grover's is... Uh, is Grover's yeah, is Grover's his grandsire. Kermit. 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 I forgot that they all have yeah. Muppet-ass names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the the funny thing is, until I, I this I just am so I just accept this place is so real that I'm like, oh, those are their names, beep boop 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 boop, and then I'm doing research for this show and getting it ready. I'm like, oh, they combined them. Oh, why they do that? Oh, because they're Muppets. They they're Muppets. All right, I get it. Um, but I I hope we do still get to meet um, at least meet um, Kermit. I don't think we're going to though. Um, and the last thing I think we is Laris is Laris Strong is the Lord of Harrenhal, and he tells the the Green Council Harrenhal is a morass and it's going to drive Damon mad. He seems to have some insight into it. He also mentions I've got all of Harrenhal's gold. It's not going to be any use to him, which is really important considering that as we talked about, Tylen also mentions they're already really worried about the the crown's coin, mm-hmm. and I think this is something that. Ended up really mattering on Game of Thrones, and it's it's great because you need money to fight a war. You can have dragons all you want, but you need money to pay for soldiers and pay for goods. And I'm glad that the show doesn't forget this. The last thing they want to do is take out a predatory loan from the Iron Bank of Bravos or another moneylender across the Narrow Sea. But, you know, history has shown that uh, that's usually the way to finance these types of things. And it'll be curious to see how the economic factor plays into it, because it's not a spoiler to say that uh, economic policy winds up becoming a huge plot point in the book uh, for generations to come. So I'm very curious to see how that's going to play out. And, you know, we've sort of alluded to that a little bit um, already with um, the funeral procession where we see just the vast swaths of people in King's Landing and, you know, characters like Hugh, the the blacksmith who is sort of having trouble feeding his family. It's going to be interesting to see how the small folk are affected by all this and what happens when uh, they push back on some of these more stringent policies that happen during wartime. And Dan, there is one thing I've been waiting to bring up. And uh, so HBO gave... uh, critics the first four episodes as she, i have been watching them weekly specifically because i did not want to know what happened so i have not mentioned this in case i accidentally spoiled it sometimes people get um straight up mad at us uh, when we don't like a change from the book and they say oh they're telling the true story of this of, of what happened that's not true and i can prove it to you right now sir the former lord commander sir harold westerling right he is long dead in Westeros. That's not something that's up for debate. He died a long time ago. He's alive. People might forget in season one, he would not allow them to just crown Aegon and he stormed off. That's how Kristen Cole became the Lord Commander. He is just out there somewhere. Sir Harold Westerling is out there and I wanted to make sure I didn't bring him up before the fourth episode in case he showed up. So I just want to remind people that we are still judging the show, which is its own version of the story. It's not the definitive one. They are making changes. It is totally fair to like some of them, to dislike some of them. But I I do find it a little frustrating when people are saying, oh, you can't criticize it because this is the true version of the story. No, it is not. And it's actually more fun to, to discuss the show if you keep that in mind, that they are making choices and we are, you know, enjoying them or not. No, of course. I think that's with any adaptation. You are, especially if you're familiar with the source material, 
ideally you're discussing it from not just a place of knowledge, but a place of passion. And that's uh, what we always strive for on this show. We are passionate about this world, the fine details, some elements that they adapt we like, some elements we don't. But I'm still thrilled to tune in each and every week and then think far too much about this show uh, with both you, Mikey, and our viewers and listeners at home. So, uh, yeah, as always, uh, we appreciate everyone's opinions and we want to foster an environment of uh, robust and rigorous debate, but a respectful one. So, uh, yeah, just uh, be nice out there, folks. Uh, unless you're going to say something nice about Kristen Cole. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Please drop drop all your Kristen Cole thoughts in the comments. We we love to hear them, even if Mikey doesn't. Uh, with that said, folks, that's about all the time we have for this episode. That's a wrap on our breakdown of House of the Dragon season two, episode four, the Red Dragon and the Gold. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we're going to be here all season long, and we have plenty of other deep dives into hot D lore waiting for you over on Nerdist.com. Now, Mikey, where can people find you or send you a digital raven out on the internet? both Blue Sky and Twitter at Burger Mike, all one word. And I want to hear from fellow book readers or people who do not care about spoilers because there is something from that scene with Rhaenyra and Jace that I think is very interesting, but we cannot discuss because it would be the biggest spoiler of all time. Uh, you can also find me at the greatest website. Anybody ever created? Nerdist.com. All right, folks, and you can also find me online at Dan Casey or at Osteoferocious, depending on the platform. And thank you again for tuning in. But in the meantime, folks, tell us, what did you think of this episode? What was your favorite moment and why? Let us know in the comments below. And for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com.